Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we're bringing in John Breen. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, Jason. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited to have you on. Uh, I, um, I mean, I, I'll be honest. The the way that I actually got became aware of you in the the community was through the the epic burn down of base camp um and you you had collected kind of a whole bunch of the the news around that but since then i've been following your work and one of the things i've seen you work on that i think is really cool is rust but before we talk about rust i would love to hear about you so for folks who aren't familiar with your work do you want to give us a little little background sure so yeah again thanks for having me um i my name's john i um kind of bounce around between stacks and stuff hence my my interest in rust um my so my day job i work at a company called lairdall labs dc uh we're in the health tech space so we make uh health care simulation software you might see me yelling about WebRTC and live video mm -hmm. and um and stuff on twitter because it's it's difficult <laughs> sure, uh, sure. <clears throat> sorry my uh a little bit um uh, but the uh you know, outside of that, that's a lot of Node, a lot of React, uh, a lot of front end, you know, some full stack. Um, but I've kind of, you know, partly I think because of my my uh, hold on. my uh, my ADHD actually, I, I like to learn new things and sure. always challenge myself and grow. Um, and so I I started my career as a Java developer, you know, way back in the the Java one four days. Uh, did some some front end desktop development there. Went to some mobile development. It did some back end there, uh, and then went to native app development. And I, I always just try to find new things to do. And so I discovered Rust. I don't remember how I got turned on to it, but I I thought it was cool. I thought it was interesting. I hadn't done a lot of systems programming in a while, so I wanted to, you know, just teach that to myself. And I had a lot of fun, kind of playing around with that, poking around different popular libraries and learning about um, something that's that's not JavaScript or TypeScript because it's been a lot of my life for the past several years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is one of those things where it's it, there's a little bit of a, um, I, I, I always want to learn new languages and Rust has been really high on my list because so many people in the, the community that I respect are really excited about Rust. Um, but you know, I, I, especially now with my new job, I have a really hard time finding time to just like try new stuff. And so the, one of the things that I look forward to most with this show is that this show is my excuse to learn new stuff. Right. And so, um, we've done a couple episodes on Rust before we've had, uh, like Chris Biscardi's been on, uh, Prince, uh, is, is Prince Wilson, um, taught us Rust. Like we, we, there's so many cool things that I've seen people do with Rust and whenever I hear people talk about like the speed of it, the the type safety, the helpful error messages, there's so many things to love about Rust as a language. Um, but I'm kind of curious, what have you found to be like when your experience, especially as somebody who's used a bunch of different languages, what are the things that really stand out to you about Rust and, and make you excited to keep using it? So yeah, I think kind of the first thing you mentioned is the speed. Uh, it's you know it does things very quickly. The you know you, people joke about the compile times because the compiler does quite a bit. But if you um, are used to uh, you know normal full stack web development, it's mm -hmm. it, it's fast and Node is very fast and JavaScript has you know V8 and things are have made a, a lot of strides. But you know I, I started my career like I mentioned in Java, but also wrote a lot of C and C++. And I just remember that kind of, you know, intense speed and kind of the, you feel like you're, you're closer to the, the metal a little bit, uh, but uh, Rust does that in a way that's more ergonomic and it's, it's more friendly to work with. You know, there's the, the whole concept of ownership that Rust has, that's it's memory management. So you're not accidentally right. um, allocating and freeing memory, then leaving it around and, you know, having people hack your clusters or whatever. Yeah, you know, that that's actually something that I've, that has always intimidated me. Whenever somebody says that they're programming close to, close to the metal, right? I, I get nervous because I'm thinking about like, wait, so that means I, I, it's not like JavaScript where you just write a variable and then you do some stuff and then you're just like, okay, I'm done. 
it's like you're allocating memory and then you got to remember to clean up that memory. And then if you don't, then you get memory leaks and things crash, not because they're broken, but because they just continually get bigger over time. Um, and, and so there's there's all these things that make me nervous. But you're, you're talking about Rust and this this concept of ownership. Does that alleviate those those safety concerns like? Uh, I think, you know, it it at least severely mitigates it. You know, it the um, the concept is that it, it the compiler does a lot of work for you to to see what memory you're allocating and, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that you don't do things in a way that that gets into a lot of those pitfalls. So um, something you'll you'll notice as you start to use it is the compiler yells at you a lot, but it, yeah. it, you know, it's a very friendly yell. And that's something that, you know, you mentioned is, is the compiler is uh, fantastic. It's one of the best compilers I've, I've worked with. It's, um, you know, it, some other languages, the compiler, you'll, it, something will break and you have no idea why. And the stack trace makes no sense, but yeah. everything I've run into in Rust, it's like, you know, the compiler breaks and then it tells you, oh, hey, you're doing this thing on this line that you maybe shouldn't do. Um, and I'm not going to let you run this program, but here's how you might fix it with this specific error code. Go to this specific, you know, link or go here to see how you might manage this. So it it kind of walks you along that way. And there are ways mm. to do things to to hop out of that in a more advanced system and and hop out of the the memory safe and explicitly do things in an unsafe manner. But you have to kind of go out of your way to do that. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's good. I like the idea of of setting up good guardrails, right? Like I, I, I feel like so much of programming was set up from this, this, um, principle of you're a developer. You're, you're probably really smart. You, here's all of the controls and no guardrails and just go build something. And then later we go, Oh, that was actually a terrible idea. Let's build frameworks to clean up these, these rough edges. I think JavaScript is a great example of that, especially like, in the pre jQuery days, you know, you had access to do a whole bunch of stuff, but you'd get yourself into big messes and you'd cause all these problems. And then jQuery was like, well, what if we took all of those sharp edges and just like took those away from you? And, and what I like, what, what you're telling me and what I like hearing is that it sounds like Rust inverted that. They're like, look, we're going to make sure there aren't a lot of sharp edges, but if you want to get into the knife drawer, like here's the key. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, so so one th another thing that I that I'm actually really interested in is the Rust community. Like I I have seen very very good things about the Rust community. Like the it seems like it's so supportive. It seems like it's very inclusive. Um, as far as I can tell, it's really welcoming. I haven't seen any memes about like somebody asking a question about Rust and getting told like get out of here, noob. Like it's very you know it seems like a very welcoming place for developers have you have you found that to be true as well i have yeah it's um you know any community is gonna is gonna have its its ups and downs but i so far and i've been you know part of several different developer communities and i think you know both specific to projects like for example i've contributed to the um starship uh terminal prompt that is uh, mm. written in rust and it's you know the folks that maintain that are, are fantastic and super helpful and like you know really you know a great model of how maintainers can do it, really do it right. Uh, but also the the broader community around Rust, it's a lot of folks who, you know, maybe didn't feel included in other communities or it's, you know, it's people who really, you know, really enjoy having fun with the, with the language. And um, like you said, I haven't really experienced a whole lot of the like, well, that's, you know, that's a terrible question kind of stuff. It's, you know, I, I don't know what specifically it is about the community. It does feel like it's it's more inclusive. It's it's not the uh, the typical like you know tech bro like kind of orange website <laughs> folks sure, who sure. will you know assume you know everything about everything and know all these really obscure words and um, so it's 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 been wonderful and I think that's a huge part of it. Like you said, it's um, programming is you know and being an engineer is at a certain point, it's really not about the code. It's about the people that you're writing with. And that's, yeah. um, you know, if you're not enjoying the thing that you're doing and you're not enjoying the people that you're around, then it's kind of, you know, it's a lot harder to get, get work done. It's a lot harder to, to actually build things that people want to use and that, that, you know, do the least harm possible to people. For sure. Yeah. Working with people that you really care about. Yeah, absolutely. 
And, and I'm hearing uh, in the in the chat, Rodelius is saying that uh, Rust also has great documentation. I've seen a little bit of that. I like I did um, Rustlings, for example, and that was that, that's great. Uh, I'll, let me. I I should probably be sharing links to stuff, right? So here's Starship that we talked about, and uh, Rustlings is like an interactive kind of. Um, how to learn Rust in your right in your terminal kind of thing, um, but the, the I haven't looked at the documentation itself too much. I I've ended up there through links in my many many errors. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, so so today we are going to try to build a command line interface. So so uh, I'll be using the CLI shorthand all day. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to even think where to start on this, right? Because it's like, oh, why would you build a CLI? But really, like, I, as a developer, it, for me at least, I use CLIs constantly. Like, I live in the CLI. I, uh, you know, I use Git for just about everything. I use, um, like, I, I work at Netlify, so I use the Netlify uh, CLI to, like, create sites and, and develop locally. Uh, whenever I'm using whatever JavaScript tool, I'm always using their CLI. You know, you got the the Gatsby Develop or the Astro Dev or whatever it is that that gets those things running. Um, but there's so many other things that you can do. So, like, what what are I guess what are your some of your favorite CLIs that you've seen out there? Um, so I you know I mentioned Starship as kind of a, a prompt. You know, a lot of people will use um, things like uh, oh my. ZSH, I guess, depending on, uh, there was a thread recently on Twitter about how to pronounce it, but um, I like a lot of those. I uh, have to give a shout out to Git. It's, uh, you know, I've used it for, for years and years. And every time I think I understand what's going on, I learn that I really don't. Mm. Um, you know, and there's fun ones, like the ones that will, um, you know, take whatever you, you input and, and output it to uh, like ASCII art of a cow uh, and, and Kind of, I guess, let me actually look at my terminal and see some of my favorites. <laughs> uh, you know, there's just a lot of, like you said, you know, as, as a developer, you you think, especially as someone who's been doing a lot of, you know, product development, a lot of uh, web app development, it's mm -hmm. CLIs often fade into the background. Yeah. Um, you think of, you know, application, you think of, let me set up an API and do these things. But um, as developers, we're doing, you know, Think a lot of things on the, the command line every day, and it's um, you know those are it. It also kind of harkens back to being able to do some small piece of functionality or something totally fun, like the one I was uh, that kind of inspired me to want to talk about this was uh, a command line I was building to uh, to journal a little bit. You know, it's mm. uh, inside of uh, inside of my terminal. I have my terminal in front of me pretty much all day, and I I need a reminder to to write down just a few seconds of thoughts every day of what I'm, you know, what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling as part of, you know, either like some therapy or some mental health work, you know, it's, sure. it was just a, a cool little idea I had to, to prompt me with some, some questions and maybe answer them. So it's, um, nice. You know, it's, it, it's just, it, for me, it's a way to, to bring the fun back to, to development in some ways, you know, I've been, uh, had, throughout my career dealing with burnout off and on. And it's, it was just a nice way to bring something different and bring some little, some cute little tools into my, into my life. Yeah. Um, I see the, the chats calling out things. I like, uh, JQ, yeah. uh, bat is a, a rust, uh, extension of cat. I'm not a hundred percent sure what bat does. I've never actually looked at it. <laughs> I I'm very, uh, I, I feel like I know about a lot of tools and I don't use any of them. I'm very like curmudgeonly and that I, I'm, I pretty much refuse to try anything until I have a very acute problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, okay. So, uh, at the, at the risk of, of, you know, I could ask so many questions about this, but I think it would probably just make sense. Let's dive in and let's start looking at, at some code. Let's see if we can build ourselves a CLI. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to jump into this screen here. And before we get started, let's do a shout out. We are being live captioned right now. We've got Rachel in with us today from White Coat Captioning, writing down all the things that we say. And thank you very much, Rachel, for being here. Um, and that is made possible by our sponsors, Netlify, Fauna, Auth0, and Hasura, all of whom are kicking in to make the show a little more accessible to more people. And today's guest is, uh, let me throw some links, huh? 
Today's guest is John Breen. Uh, make sure you go and follow John on the Twitter. Lots of good information on there. Um, and it's like more more than just, it's, this is not a, a tech feed. You're like a whole person feed, and I dig that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so definitely go, it's a good follow. Um, we're learning Rust today. So make sure you go and get on, get into that uh, if you need it. There's This is where we're gonna find documentation and all those sorts of things. We were talking about Starship. I threw a link to that in the chat. We'll, we'll throw another one down. Uh, and we also talked about rustlings. Um, and Eco shared this link. This is when Prince came and, and did an intro to Rust. So we aren't going to do a full intro because uh, we, we just we want to make sure we get through the whole CLI. But if you are for, if you're a first timer and you want to learn what Rust is, this is a great episode. Prince is an amazing teacher and also just a I've called him anthropomorphized sunshine. He is a wonderful person that uh, is going to bring a lot of joy into your life. Okay, so with that being said, here I am. I am in. I'm in VS Code. I have nothing but a README, and I am. Oh, here you are. Uh, let's let me let me bring you in, and see if we can. There you are. Okay. So we are now doing a, a VS Code live share. I asked John to live share with me because I was worried that I was going to forget all the syntax. Um, but so I'm I'm now ready to start. What's the first thing I should do? Um, so we uh, I don't know that we mentioned it yet, but the the main um, tool or package manager, speaking of CLIs, uh, is for Rust is Cargo. Um, so that's uh, kind of a package manager. It's a build tool. It's very similar to uh, npm if you're familiar. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how we create new projects. So I okay. think uh, if I do create... have it installed. I found out. <laughs> right. So cargo. What's the command? Cargo new. I think. Um, I don't know if if there's an init. If you're already in the same folder. Let's see. Oh, that's a good question. Let's see. Um, cargo see, new. Actually, that's. I'll do that in a folder that doesn't exist yet. But if I need to, I can. Uh, I can create like a new folder in here. Is it going to let me do? Ah, so you can use cargo init, create a new cargo package in, in an existing directory. Perfect. Yep, there you go, Chris. Thank you. Cool. Oh, it happened so fast that I didn't even notice it. All right, so <laughs> so I ran cargo init, and that gave us a, a cargo.toml. Right. Um, it's nine lines of code. Mm -hmm. So we've got the Rust CLI. We've got an empty dependencies array because it's Toml. Mm -hmm. um, and then let's see, we've got a git ignore that skips the target. And then we have this main.rs with a, a hello world in it. Perfect. OK, yep. so so far, I get what all of this code does. Um, and I, if we run this then, so if I want to run this, I would do, uh, actually, run. that's a, just cargo run. Yeah. Hey, there it is. And if we go in and change this, and we run it again. All right, we're right in Rust, everyone. Um, nice. So then the next thing that we would want to do is what? So if we're doing a, a command line app, I, uh, there's a, a dependency that I really like. Um, it's called clap, C-L-A-P. Um, OK. And it's. Uh, Command line, I think that's command line arc parser is what it's short for, but uh, we're going to want to add that as a dependency. It gives you that's, kind of. I like legit didn't put together that that was an acronym until. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was may, just like, I somebody have, was like, oh. I may have literally <laughs> made that up, but it makes sense to me. Um, but yeah, it's it, it gives you uh, various patterns for uh, working with. So Rust does have a built in uh, arc parse. Um, okay. What's it called? Uh, library or you know functionality, but uh, I, I like to. Clap gives us a um, few patterns. You can do it with YAML. I think you can like generate one. You can generate one with macros. But I, what I really like oh. to do is uh, you can generate it in code with a like a has a builder pattern. So that mm. way it gives you kind of a okay. more uh, so kind of ergonomic interface. So what we do to add dependencies yeah. is we go, we can go into our cargo.toml file. Um, All right, we, here we are. Uh, where's 
I lost my live share. There it is. And we can add our um, dependency there. So that's kind of the, I think the newest version is 3.0 beta so, 2. And so the pattern here is we add the, the name of it and then we do equals and then whatever version we want to bring down. And is this like, is this a, a pinned version? Like it'll never update even if a beta dot three drops or does it do kind of like the, the. It should give you that version. There's also a lock, a cargo dot lock file right there. If you see it, um, it and it'll, I think it might do similar to like NPM where it um, generates a very specific or it uses a very specific version, but okay. you get. Um, cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, did I do the. I did alias to, I did alias Corgo to Cargo. Yes, I did that. I thought I just didn't, I thought I just didn't understand the font that you were using. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, it, it, it um, Oh my God, I did that like subconsciously. A... <laughs> <laughs> okay. I definitely spend way too much time. <laughs> Talking about Corgis. <laughs> okay. Uh, good. All right. So, all right. So now we've got this dependency. Do I have to do anything to install it, or will it just install when we when we compile? Oh, so then the next time you run Cargo Run, it should um, automatically bring that in and nice. compile it alongside of your application. Um, and uh, so we blah, 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 so that we can actually go to the page for, let's see, Rust. Let, yeah, let me. In line. Oops. It's the bat builder pattern, so I'll send. There's the Twitch, there's the Twitch. Where's the chat? Oh, the chat's hiding from me. My computer is just not cooperating with me today. <laughs> Okay, so here's our. So yeah, oh, we've like got the, the the builder pattern down the. Yeah, so that's that's how I prefer. I, I mean, others might have other preferences. There's various different ways to do use macros and YAML, but um, so what it does here is um, you create an application inside of your main function. Um, you okay. give it a name and a version and everything, um, and then you can give it different types of arguments. Got it. Okay, so let's do. Let's do this. Uh, first of all, chat. What is our, what is our app today? What are, what's our CLI for? What are we, what are we gathering information about? And while you do that, I'm going to set up our basics. So I'm going to bring in uh, clap. So I'm using clap, and then I'm, I'm specifically using arg and app. All right. And so this is sort of like, um, like named imports. Is that, is that right? Right, so you have, I think it's called a, a prelude, which is kind of like a namespace, um, or I think similar, maybe similar to like a prototype in JavaScript, but um, yeah, it's that will bring in your dependency. Uh, and you may notice like the, the main function, if you've ever written C, it looks uh, somewhat similar to that functionality, or I guess Python or anything that has a main function. Nice, yeah. Um, Nikki came in first with Burger Builder, so I'm I'm all <laughs> in on it. Let's do, yeah, smash burger. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, okay, no, perfect. This is an opportunity to troll Sarah Drasner even further. So let's build a Rust CLI that, uh, that helps you build a correct burger. Um, <laughs> and for those of you who aren't familiar, I have been, I built this website with Sarah Drasner to, uh, to give each other crap about our preferred burgers. So I do a, a smash burger. Um, and she does a sous vide burger, which I call a splash burger, where she just kind of tosses it in the in the bath to boil. Um, her animation is better. My burger is better. So, <laughs> anyways, if you want to go play with that, that was a fun site. And let's uh, let's 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 not lose the plot. I'm not uh, I'm not going to do that thing where I rabbit hole for 45 minutes on something unrelated. Okay, so we've got a burger builder, and then I need to set a version. So I'm going to set the version to, we'll call it 1.0. Um, I need an author and just put this in here. Okay. And then, kind of one thing, one thing I also really like about all this, um, this library is they have some examples for ways to like, you can, for the version and the author, I believe they have macros that you can get the version off of the 
the cargo.toml. So it locks, it pins the version of the the command line application to the version of your, your project itself. Mm. So you don't have to define it in two places, but that's, um, you know, just fun, fun facts then, you know, yeah. Okay. So, so I've got the stuff that makes sense to me. I've got a, you know, I, I get, I'm, I'm giving it a name, a uh, version author and, and some about now we're getting into args and, and I can see that the args kind of have nested config here. Right. Um, so can we talk through kind of let's, let's maybe think in comments, um, through what we want to do here. So like, I would like to make this a little bit wider so we can see what we're doing. Um, and we want to, let's say, come on, look at Copilot knowing, <laughs> knowing my heart. Uh, no, I feel like we, we should ask for like, um, some different toppings that you would add, right? Like, uh, select toppings. And then we probably want like defaults, um, to like lettuce and pickle or something. Um, that's contentious. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we want to, um, like select style, uh, and we would want like options, right? So we have options and you can choose, look at a copilot go. That's it's really, it really is upsetting how close to correct it is. Um, so we can, we can say smash, or wrong um and then like we would default to to smash uh all right what else what else i mean maybe we can start there right we've got um like a multi-select and a single select so with these we would want options and so your options would be like an array of uh lettuce pickles onions cheese uh, sauce. I don't know. That's probably good enough. Right. Um, so that's two feels like it would be and Oh, and then we want some like text input. So let's do a, uh, name for the order. And that's just like a string input. Any other, any other styles that we should add or any other, any other cool features that you want to show off that we should include in this list? I think I'm happy with this so far. Okay. So the part that I get is I get this dot arg. And so I'm seeing here, we're using that named arg import. And so I can say new, and then I just put in like toppings. Yes. Okay. So at this point I'm lost. So what what are these next pieces here so like there's they're short there's long there's value name and then i see some stuff about being required or or taking multiple yeah um, so for short and long i don't know that we need to necessarily worry about that's like if you want um if you have like a command line you know for example if you have like npm uh installed dash d versus dash dash save dev i think it is mm -hmm, um, okay. so we can you know it's uh, a way to handle both short and long uh, types of flags. Um, okay. I'm going to start with style. That seems more. Okay. So, um, so we don't need short and long value name. I assume is like what shows up in the program for use. Yes. So we would give it like burger style and then about would be what type of burger do you want? Um, and then takes value is, is that yes. like a option thing or? It's a good question. I don't know that that's, oh yeah, I think what we want is, uh, I do think we want that to be true because I think, you know, takes value versus not is, you know, a flag versus something that takes an input value. Um, oh, I understand. Okay. So, so this would be, um, if we, if we don't set takes value to true, 
then you would it would be like setting um, like dash v is for the version and you don't take a value for that you just say v and that shows the version and if it's if it's present you do the version if not so it's like a boolean flag i believe so yeah okay okay i got you um well maybe we can just start here and see if this does what we want so so we've got our our matches we've we're setting up the program we're taking our first argument which is style mm -hmm. and then we have um a value that's going to come out we have a description for it and that it takes a value. So right now I believe it's going to be just an arbitrary kind of, you, you drop it in. Um, and then it looks like at the end we run get matches. Is that? Yeah, I think you might need to close your, um, here, I'll do it. I forgot that I can do it. <laughs> close this here. Uh, wait. That's oh, right. I know what I did. I, I didn't oh, yeah, realize that, is... that that arg had to be open like that. Right, yeah, because that okay. takes an arc, which is... Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so we've got this. It doesn't like my FN. Oh, that? I need my... Expected there value. we go. Yeah, semicolon. That's, yeah, exactly. That's where the, you know, I mentioned the compiler gives you some nice things. Nice, okay. So then, um, this would probably... Actually, let's just run this and see what happens. I'm going to do cargo run. Sure, it's going to do much, but see, it's compiling all that. It's bringing in that library mm -hmm. and compiling things. And it, it should do probably nothing, right? Because it's not like blocking on this. We're not building like a, this isn't like one of those, those CLIs where it's going to ask us a series of questions. This is like, right. we just pass flags. Right. Okay. Um, this oh, is yeah. intentional. It's oh, because we didn't ever use it. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, so that's what I was mentioning about it being, you know, kind of uh, kind to you when you do something wrong. It's, you know, hey, mm -hmm. you meant to do this. Yeah, uh, that's actually really, I mean, this is great because this this wasn't just like a, you, your compile failed on line nine. It's like, hey, fix it like this, you doofus, but like lovingly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Levinson, yes, I, it, the copilot is what's giving me all the help. Um, that's that's where the suggestions are coming from. But so okay, so so then I, if I what if I want to cargo run this, I would just do style and smash, and like theoretically that would run it as if it was the command line it, argument. You might need a another um, dash dash after the run, so that way. Um, it passes the flags to the Got it. dash dash space. Yeah, like that. Okay. So it passes that. So, too. so what this means uh, to re to make sure I understand it correctly, we we're running cargo run, and if we didn't add this, these would be flags passed to cargo run. Right. So instead, what we're doing is we're saying cargo run with no flags, and then to the script that's being run because we're we're skipping in, run these flags. Right, exactly. Okay. So it's passing. You might see something similar when you're doing um, particular like NPM things or you want to pass like a flag to node instead of directly to NPM. It's you know a way to pass arguments to the binary instead of to the thing that you're running. Okay, so I did break it. And I'm Let's not see. sure what I did. Because it says... An argument style. Oh, you might actually need... The, that the long thing that I told you that you didn't need. <laughs> oh, Let's okay. See. So I I do long style. Thanks, Copilot. <laughs> run it again. And this time it did run. Okay, so we still get that that warning about matches. Right. Um, but we're it not took doing anything. style. But that's also really cool. So if I run style and then this is not real, it's gonna fail and say, hey, this doesn't exist. So right. now and we it, also know whether or not we've appropriately registered these flags. Right. And it, it also, you it may have noticed there at the end that it, um, Pat, it automatically creates like a help for you. That's um, really nice. So it, it'll tell you like what arguments and the builder, you know, it'll build it for you and tell you what you can do. And that's where a lot of the like about text comes in and the value name and everything. Yeah. Well that, I mean, that's super handy. Like this is okay. 
So, so we've gotten to the point where we can put data in, but as we can see, nothing actually happens here. So right. um, if we want to display that, what do we do next? So now we have to actually parse out. So we created that matches um, mm -hmm. variable. We actually have to parse that out. Um, so what you might see in the readme there uh, is you have to unwrap. So you can't just uh, interact with with something. So what happens with matches is it's uh, in Rust what's called an optional. Okay. Um, so it this actually the syntax. If you ever written Swift, it kind of looks like that. And I know a lot of Rust people will yell at me if I say Rust looks a lot like Swift in a lot of ways, but not yell. They'll they'll kindly say yes, I know. <laughs> um, so what we're doing here is it's forcing the compiler is is asking us to explicitly handle the fact that this thing so matches that value of either returns um, none or it returns something. And we have to unwrap that. Um, so I'm just gonna first. like look at them, look at this. It's amazing. <laughs> so it it figured out that. And so if I run it like this, and then let's run it appropriately with it with a flag that exists. Theoretically speaking, it should now print out you want a smash burger. I got something wrong. I wonder if you need the oh, if you need value of to be just style. I think it might actually be the name of the flag. Let me see. That. Okay, let's try that. Yes. Oh, okay. So that's interesting. So this is only for docs. This is so this is what you use in the program, and this is what displays in the help. So if I if I run a bad one, we can see. So this is what shows up in the the help text, but it looks like that's not actually what shows up in the um, in the code. It's style that shows up in Got the code. It. Okay, that makes sense. I get that. Uh, so then let's do let's do something else. I want to have a guard for for valid values. So is that something that's built into um, into clap, or is that something that I would just write some logic for here, like if the value is one of these allowed values? Um, I think you can do both. There should be, so where's the, I just did this in my thing. There, there's pattern matching, so. Uh, oh, is it? Let's see, match. This, this is pattern matching here? Yeah, so it looks may look kind of like a, a switch um, statement. So instead of doing the if, we would do matches. So inside of the if, because the if is un, oh. is, un, is unwrapping. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So let's do match uh, matches, or this would just be I, right? Uh, yes. Because we we already have access to it here, yeah. um, and then. Come on, Copilot, you <laughs> you cheeky. Oh, that's wild. Uh, and then the, the default is the underscore. That's the bottom here? Yeah. OK. Preferably not with ableist language like this documentation has, but you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, wait, I don't like so yeah, that syntax. So the the funky kind of print line syntax is in Rust. It's a macro, mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, not quite a function. It's it's something different. But it, the print line is you you'll see macros prefaced with uh, or suffix with the exclamation mark. Nice. Um, and then inside of there, you can see kind of the the string interpolation happening. Yeah. Okay. This is man, this, is, this is slick. Like. I was expecting this to be a little head bendy for me, and it feels real like this. I love pattern matching. I wish this was built into into JavaScript so badly. It's such a nice setup. Um, but okay, so let's let's try this again. We're gonna we're gonna run with a smash burger. It says I'm gonna make a smash burger. Now I'm gonna say something else. Um, 
we'll say like like one of those burgers that's like this tall that they got to stick a knife in it to make it not fall over <laughs> um yeah there we go look the, the app works um and then we can you know we could add even some some other stuff in here so like if you say sous vide say like nice try sarah it'll be interesting to see how it handles two words i have like a guess line. that i need to do it like this yeah, because if I because if I do it without the quotes, I think it's going to treat it as multiple arguments. Yeah, so we would need with the quotes. Perfect. Cool. Okay, so this is an extremely judgmental command line interface. <laughs> um, no, this is. I mean, this is amazing. I love this. It's. I'm. I'm like already. I can see how much I just, I just like Rust. Like I liked it when, when Prince showed me, I like it when people show me how they're building stuff in Rust and seeing this, I'm just like, man, I just want to build more Rust stuff. Um, so let's do, let's do some toppings, right? Like toppings are going to be kind of the same, same general setup here. Uh, so I think I can just kind of copy paste this whole thing. Um, but what I want with toppings is I do want to include a short, or we'll do short of T. Get out of here, Copilot. You can't possibly know that. Can't wait until, well, I guess my code my code's not on GitHub, so it's not gonna randomly start copy and pasting my own code into here, but. <laughs> um, let's see, so what toppings do you want on your burger? And then each one of these is going to be a topping, but I want it to be able to select multiple. What, what did I do wrong? Why is it yelling at you? What? Are, uh -oh. you just, are you just confused? No, I think it's so. This is where we run into uh, some of the memory management things in in Rust. It um, because of the way strings work. You know, strings a lot of times will end up on the heap, and you have to because we don't know how big they're going to be and they have like a, a string pointer and there's a few different types, but let's see how they... I just looked and they just single quote it and that made it go away. Yeah, yeah. So now I have questions. <clears throat> and if this is too esoteric, feel free to just like, I can go do my own research. Why did that make a difference? Like what, what's our... So single quotes and double quotes are different in Rust? Right, so... Uh, the type that this function expects, I think Chris mentioned in chat, it's it's a character uh, versus a string. Um, so it's um, oh yeah. So it's it you're not gonna it's not just you know like JavaScript where there are different ways to reference to create string literals. Um, okay, so they're, so they're not the so, same thing. They, right, like, so strings and characters are treated as different uh, types. Okay. And so what we're seeing is, is if it's a single quote, you get one character. If it's a string, like multiple characters, you use double quotes. And if you try to use double quotes for a single character and it's expecting a character, it will yell at you. Right. So I think, you know, the way that this, uh, this library was written, the, the short it. function expects explicitly a character, which is where we're, you know, seeing the, the statically typed, you know, compiled language thing us or I guess if you're using like TypeScript if you you know try to pass a number into something and expects a string it's just going to yell at you so sure yeah yeah okay um yeah, yeah I'm see I'm seeing there's a there's some comments uh Oscar Allen says uh the the string versus and string and and that's you mentioned this very quickly but you were talking about the idea of like is it owner it's like ownership right so like everything is a scope in in programming Right. And you can like, you, everything is owned by one scope in Rust, but you can like let another scope borrow it. Right. And so, that's what the ampersand is. So with, with uh, the quoted string like that, it's a, you know, it's a string literal. We know exactly how long it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, for, for the, the in string, the ampersand string, it's uh, yeah, exactly. The best advice is don't worry about it yet. Let the compiler yell at you when you use the wrong one and then Google how to that's, convert to the other. Fair. But that's it's fair. It, what it, it is exactly. It's a pointer to the, the string itself. So if we have a string mm. that we don't know, um, 
how big it's going to be. It could be dynamically generated. Um, it's, you know, that's when I think we get into talking about uh, stacks and heaps and um, okay. how memory how memory is allocated so that we know exactly what memory we need to hold on to. Right. And and so I'm, I'm going to take Oscar Allen's advice and ignore that because because <laughs> right now, like you just started saying that stuff and I got sweaty. <laughs> um, but OK, so so now we can do one topping. Right. So let's try it. I'm going to do uh, we want a smash burger. And for the topping, uh, I want, let's say, lettuce. Right? Um, could not compile. Why couldn't you compile? Expected. Oh, wait, what did I do? Oh, I didn't save. Oh, now I've saved. <laughs> okay. So it says a smash burger, right? Uh, we should change this. Asked for a smash burger, right? Okay, so that's good. And then down here, we want to do, I'm just going to copy paste this whole block because we're going to do um, some changes on the toppings, which are, yep, toppings. Um, and we want topping to be long. I, I, have, I have a plan on what I'm trying to do here. So my thought is we want toppings to be an array of, of input. Um, and so my thinking is we'll do like a print and it'll say you we will just do topping so that I don't have to figure out how to make this work. And then um, for the match, we'll put in our like the available toppings and then we can just print. If I just want to print the, the value, do I just put like the I in here or do I need to do the like string with the the curly braces and then pass it as an argument. I think the compiler is going to yell at you if you try to just uh, pass it in as an argument. Uh, but okay. you, so what you can do is do you know the string an empty string with an empty curly brace inside and then pass it in. Right. Uh, okay. So for these, uh, we would do I'm trying to think like what are the what are the available lettuce pickles? Uh, we'll copy paste this. Pineapple. Putting pineapple on a burger? What are you, an anarchist? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, let's pick up pineapple. <laughs> Tomato, uh, onion. That's that's good enough. We'll we'll stick with these. Um, and then if you don't, let's see, we don't have. Sorry. So if we don't have something that you want, we'll just let me fix this formatting because I think it's going to should fit at least. Yeah. All right. So uh, it doesn't like this because I forgot to add a semicolon. So this then should mean that we get each of our toppings and it shows us what we picked. Um, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make these into like a bulleted list. Okay, so now if I run with lettuce, it should say you picked a smash burger, toppings are lettuce. Okay, but then I want to do like lettuce and onion. Right. And it, and it starts to break on me because it was provided more than once but cannot be used multiple times. And so now I'm trying to figure out what do we do to work around that? Right, I think looks like we have the ability to use the, the multiple occurrences. Um, so I just like you'll... drop in dot multiple occurrences. Yeah. So the example they give is for like a verbosity flag. Um, if you pass, you know, a lot of command lines, if you do dash V and then dash VV, then dash VVV, there's different levels of verbosity. Um, oh. But I think, let's see. Occurrences of, let's see. I don't, then I don't know how to, to pull out all of the different values as an array. There's got to be a function in here somewhere, though, that the uh, let's see if the auto autocomplete IntelliSense will let us. Would let's see. So the value of style. Would we just need to? Would we just need to maybe? I'm going to try something and see if 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 I'm understanding how to debug Rust. I'm <laughs> going to attempt 
to print out the matches value of toppings. Oh my goodness, Copilot, stop it. You know, I could just take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm doing it wrong. Cannot be it's, formatted with a default formatter. Yeah, so it's an option like we mentioned, um, which means it may be null. Or oh, so I got to do this thingy? Yeah, so inside you can just print, try to print the value of i inside of the, uh, well, I, the if. So my thinking is what I'm what I'm hoping is that clap is going to give us back like an array and that array might be empty. Is that I mean maybe I'm maybe I'm incorrect. Let's we can try it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it looks we... like it it looks like it it's giving you back an option that's a string uh, or a string pointer, I guess. Okay, so let's see what we get back here. We pretty printed and it says some lettuce which means it no, it's just didn't pick up the, the second one. argument. It might it it might just grab the first value. Let me see what. Let me look in the code for clap to see. Ba, 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 ba. Where's the matches? I'm guessing there's a separate function we can call that pulls out all of the different. Got it. Got it. Got it. Da, 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 da. Source. Where? I'm also wondering if we just type like matches dot, and if we see any of the autocomplete, give us. Oh any yeah, help. that's what a what a great idea. Let the tools do the work. Or I guess um, what is it? Control. Is it control enter. Control space bar. My brain is not working. Index because of. Value of values of ah, that might give you. Let's see what let's see what happens. Nope, not that one. Here, this one. Try it again, and it shows us. No, doesn't like that, and it didn't like it because. Yeah. Oh, the debug trait is not implemented. Oh, okay, um, values does not implement debug. So does that mean that I need to do something else? Like, do we Let's see what values gives us values of? So values is a struct. So let's see, it gets a value struct which implements iterator. So we can actually just iterate over it. Oh, I did screw that up. That's that's can, true. Um, do something like. The cool part is, yeah, you can control click into like um, into the actual source code of the library, and it'll pass like it'll bring you into where did I go? There I am. So I love live share; such a good feature. Uh, okay, so let's talk through what just happened here. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, this is kind of nasty at rest right now because you see the the unwrap is going to let's see. So matches, we know what matches dot value of values of is going to give us a. It's going to give you a values. Oh my gosh. That's not working. But then so, I can I can just drop vowels right in here. That looks like it's gonna work. Let's try so. it. Uh, let's see. Hey. So yeah. So there's a little bit of nastiness that we're doing here. Um, okay. So so let's just step through it and and kind of work through yeah. what's happening in our heads. So we've got our our matches, mm -hmm. and we got our values of, and so the yep. values of is. Uh, a struct and right. a struct is is to use a very poor analogy it's kind of an object is that right yeah so it's an object with a like a defined set of fields like if you think like an analog in typescript to be a type like it has you know mm -hmm. uh, a defined interface of things that it accepts and it has behavior that um that comes along with it okay uh, and this is a struct so to um you know, 
I think Chris mentioned in chat that uh, the debug printing relies on a trait called debug, mm -hmm. uh, which I think just about a lot of, if not almost every uh, built-in type in Rust has a, uh, implements the debug trait, which basically if you're thinking in terms of like, you know, think back to Java, if you implement the two string method, um, but it, uh, well, my brain just rebooted. <laughs> so no it's, uh, you can implement traits to, to give yourself built-in functionality, but here we have uh, values struct that implements the uh, iterator trait, I believe. Um, so it can be iterated. Uh, okay. So it, so what we're doing here is we're doing dot unwrap because we have an optional and dot unwrap. If you have an optional, it's the equivalent of give me this thing, but then crash the program <laughs> and panic if, um, so Rust has two different types of uh, main errors. They don't really do like exception handling. They do recoverable errors and unrecoverable errors. So unrecoverable errors will crash the program or panic. Um, and there are recoverable errors, which the compiler forces you to handle. Um, and so here, this would be effectively, so we see the safe way is the if let sum below, mm -hmm. that's un unwrapping it into an object and then only executing the code inside the if, if the thing is not null um, Got it. or not none, if it's actually present. Um, but unwrap is basically a way to force it to not be null, but then panic if the, if it is missing. Um, okay. So it's kind of, it's kind of one of those things we talked about where you can do things in a, in some of it, somewhat of a less ideal way if you're trying to do hack something together quickly. Sure. Um, and, and so the, to, to kind of repeat this back and make sure I understand it. So, so by default, what we've done is we've put this into a, a sum structure which means that sum is like um it oh, i'm not gonna say the word but i, I feel like it's it, so it's like a promise like basically when you get a promise the promise might be rejected or it might be fulfilled but it's always a promise and so you can depend on that in your application and then re react to it based on whether or not it it has a certain thing so a sum might be empty and you can say you don't have anything in this collection or it can have something in which case you can do something about that. Um, but when we unwrap that, we're basically saying, just give me whatever's inside this thing and I'll deal with it. Uh, sort of. So <laughs> I thought so, I, was, I was like, yeah, oh, I mean, that's, that more, more or less. Yeah, more or less. Yes. Um, I don't think it, it's not going to handle like empty arrays or anything. So an option is a, uh, it either has a value or it doesn't. Sure. Uh, and so a sum is, uh, a way to safely say only run this code if something is in here if it's mm -hmm. not you know nothing um and then an unwrap is uh, let me you know trying to think of a way to like an, an analog to this like you're basically not null checking the thing before you run it you're saying unwrap gotcha. this thing into whatever its value is so um so optional or option is an enumeration that, uh, yeah, I was just about, yeah, exactly. It's an enum. It's either a sum with something or it's none. Got so it. the if let Got sum it. is pattern matching effectively on if this thing is a sum, give me the value inside it. Um, and dot unwrap is saying, you know, I'm expecting this thing to always be a sum with the value inside it. So uh, it, in the case that that were, yeah, if nothing happens or if nothing's there, then the program will crash at that point versus okay. if let sum, the program will do nothing if there's nothing in it, but it won't crash. Gotcha. Okay. No, that, that makes sense. So, so now that we've got these values, um, I think we need to rewrite this a little bit. And instead of doing the, the, if let, we need to just loop, right? Like we, we need to just kind of for each but I, I'm not quite sure what the equivalent of that is in, in Rust. So what we see here is the dot collect takes that iterator. Um, we can actually just, we don't necessarily need to collect it, but um, so we can leave. I think there's a for in. Uh, so you can just 
let me get some of the syntax. So why, oh, I'm in the wrong part of the code. I was like, why does this look different? So we do. <laughs> We have nice, and then value. but then we can. Oh, you know what we could actually do? What if we do this? We can just move this right up here, and we can say we won't actually try to to pull the values out unless we're sure something is there. Right. And then we can move our match inside of this for loop, and that should. Let's see. Do this. Wait, how about I do this? Boom, 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 boom. At that point, we don't actually need to match val. We need to do this. We can do. I don't even know if we necessarily need to collect, because collect is taking the iterable thing and forcing it into a vector, which a vector is uh, similar to an array. Oh, uh, I wait, did but... I just break this whole thing? Because we, because the I is just oh, getting the you know first what? one. Is that right? Do we need to pull it out? There we go. Matches the value uh, values of. That's what we want. So that's giving us the values, and now we can do that. That should work. This okay. is not gonna. Yeah, that should be fine. There it goes. We did it. Okay, cool. so now I can drop out this part where we're doing a print. Try it again. All right, let's try it with something else. Let's add. Uh, let's add pineapple, like, like the chaotic evil we are. Um, <laughs> oh wait, I did the wrong thing. Excellent. Okay, this is great. I'm I'm like super happy about this. And then if we want to, so let's let's do something like the uh, let's add one that we don't have. So we'll add um, pumpkin. Nice, I love it. Oh, this is that's so funny. I love this. I'm I'm so happy about this. Like this this feels like it's all coming together. It doesn't feel super mysterious. I, there's a little bit of of just like foundational rust that I need to learn to so that things like this don't feel quite so like what is going on. Um, but this is the sort of thing that, that you would learn from, you know, watching the the What is Rust episode with Prince. I'll link to that again. Um, and I will also uh, just do another shout out to Rustlings, which I think is really good about um, kind of introducing you to these concepts through through some pretty hands-on kind of setups. Uh, and, there's, and there's a lot of ergonomic stuff you could do. Like this is starting to get pretty nested here. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's a lot of uh, helper functions and things like that on uh, types and collections, which is where traits really become fantastic because it's, you know, it's essentially it's compositional behavior. Like if you, as long as your, uh, for example, your values struct implements uh, the iterable interface or iterator, it's like you know, sort of like implementing an interface in Java, mm -hmm. um, you get a lot of behavior for free out of the, out of the language that um, that you don't have to do necessarily the most verbose way. Uh, like, I want to say if you even want to do like like matches that like that you can you don't have to do an if let here. You could do like uh, values of uh, unwrap or and you can pass in defaults and things like that. So it lets you kind of code in the way that your your brain thinks. Like if you think you know like this is straightforward to read, then you can keep it this way. Or if you want to write mm -hmm. it slightly differently um, and, you know, more functional manner, then you can do that. Or... Well, you know, we, we've we got 25 minutes here, or I guess probably 20 minutes left. So why don't we do a little refactor here? Because I'm, I'm seeing an opportunity, which okay. is that we, we have a couple other things that we would probably want to include. And like, if this was an ordering app, we would want, uh, you know, we'd have our, our toppings, and then we'd also want to do another option, which is like we can select delivery or pickup. Um, and then we'd want another option. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that we would want to do. So I can see this starting to get pretty repetitive. So maybe maybe it does make sense to to kind of abstract this out a little bit. So if you were going to do that, where would you start? Um. So let's think about kind of. I guess let me scroll up a little bit. 
Yeah, yeah let thinking. me go find you. <laughs> I think if we have um, a required if, I'm not sure I follow. Oh, like if you have one flag, if you're required to do something else, is that what I'm seeing in the chat here? Oh yeah, Jacob, can you can you clarify that? Like um, required if condition is met, like so, like if you say, um, if you say you want lettuce, you have to specify between iceberg or romaine, that kind of thing. Or if, if you, delivery, give address. Yeah, yeah okay. I was going to say that's exactly yeah. what I was going to say. It was like, if you have delivery, then give an address. All right. So um, let's let's set. Actually, you know what? That sounds like more fun than refactoring code. And it's something that we can learn together. So let's do um, uh, let's do order type. And we'll just skip the short and we'll instead say, let me unpin because that's going to jump around. Otherwise, uh, we'll do order type. And we don't want multiple occurrences. Okay. I'm gonna simultaneously add the address here. Nice. Okay. Oops. That was the wrong keyboard shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we've got, you can choose dine-in, pickup, or delivery, um, and then it'll ask, this one we only want to ask for delivery. So, to do that, we need to, oh, did it change my order type? That's cool, it like reformatted that for me. It's like, here you go, doofus, you can't do that. Uh, so, we know that we need an order type. And so then if I if I go and run this right now, well, I guess we running it would do nothing because we haven't set anything up yet. But we can set down here, um, let's go with this one. Actually, we can just copy paste this whole block, can't we? So let's copy paste this, go below this if block, and we'll say uh, order type. And if the order type is delivery, then we need to do something. Um, and otherwise, we can just, you ordered for delivery or you ordered for pickup or dine-in, right? Um, we could make that more restrictive. Like if you said something that wasn't in the list, we could, you know, obviously we could pattern match that here and, and do that sort of thing. Um, but this should be good enough. But so here, this, this now is something that I haven't tried yet, which is we want to do additional logic based on this. And we also haven't checked like if the delivery address is set sort of thing. Like, um, so is this something that clap handles for us or are we, are we kind of writing the logic on our own here? Uh, I don't see built in logic for it. I see like they have sub commands where like if you did. Um... Oh, wait, I, apparently I had scrolled to exactly the right place. Oh, Requirement yeah. rules can be required, can be required only if certain arguments are present. Good, good. Cool. Okay. Um, so how do we do that? How do we do that? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to find requirement rules. Documentation. I'm going to click this button. Um, is there a, like a required, required true? Mm -hmm. Features. Mm hmm. Trying to find I don't it. see it in these docs, but oh, arg with name input, arg with name. No, we already said okay. So, if their examples have something, examples. Uh, 
required crew. But I want it to be. What if it just auto completes for us? Does that do anything? <laughs> required if. Requires if. Oh, there we go. So Jason just, or Jacob just posted. Oh, I just clicked the wrong button. Okay, so we've got Jacob to the rescue. Required if. So required if other arg value. Oh, perfect. That's exactly what we want. So yep. we're going to do required if, and it would be order type equals delivery. And it doesn't like this because. Don't you lie to me. You showed me that. With name. Required if equal. I wonder if they rewrote Maybe. this. Let's see. Well, see, this is interesting because th these ones are like with name instead of new. Yeah, I think that's a different version of the. Oh, we're on the the version three beta of. Let's see, clap. Oh. Three beta. Arc new. Let's see. Required. Can I just like? Can you just grab different versions on here? Yeah, there should be uh, the little um, box or the crate up at the top. There you go. See where it says clap two point. Got it. Got it. Got it. OK, just needed to make the window bigger. That makes this way easier to navigate. So here's required if equals, which is, I think, what we're. Yeah. So it's the same thing. They just changed it mm -hmm. in 3.0 um, to to make it, I guess, a little more clear because that is pretty clear. Required if equal if, if the other input is whatever. Um, so now if I try to run this. I will say, and, oh yeah, we need to set this one to just be required in general. So required, true. Side note, docs.rs is fantastic. This is amazing. Um, I like, I love you this whole any, setup. You can search any crate and it'll give you. I like the consistency of it too. The the fact that the docs are like generate. So these, these I assume are, are generated, right? Or I guess uh, they're not really. They're, these are these look like they're written by a human. I imagine it's there's some degree of <laughs> structure to it. A bit um, of both. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So now that I've set this, I'm gonna run it. Um, let's go. We'll we'll simplify this down a little bit. We're gonna do style smash. Uh, we'll give it a topping of lettuce, and it should yell at me. Yes, you need a required argument of order type. Great. So let's do order type. Um, we'll do pickup. You ordered for pickup. Great. Now let's order for delivery. And it says, nope, you got to do an address. Oh, that's amazing. Yup. OK, so that then we would down here uh, would order type. So we would need um, how would we do this? So so what I need to do then in here is if we're in delivery, can I do a little bit of logic? Because what I want to do here is is if it's delivery, I want to then get the value of address with this same kind of logic and print it will be delivered to and then show the address. Right. What I would typically do is I would write that as like its own separate function. They can call that function inside that line. That way okay. it doesn't start to get unwieldy. That works. Yeah, let's do um, it. So I have, um, let's see, we'll do get address. And I would get the, the like, is it a argument? Wait, what, what do we want to, yeah, what do we want to pass in here to like our I'm, I'm going to pass in, I assume, either the matches or like, let's actually, why don't we just pass in the matches so that we can do easier, easier math. And that means this is an 
Can Jeez. I just write arg matches and it does, it's going to know what that means? You might need to preface it. You might oh you might need to put it in your um at the very top in the oh, why do I keep saying this if I know that I have live share and I can do it myself. <laughs> Let's see. We can put it up in the thing in the top, the import, the use statement. Okay. What was it called? Arg matches. Okay. So I'm making some some big assumptions here because I don't really know what any of this means. So I'm I'm my function is to get arg matches, and then it doesn't like it says it's never used, that's fine. So then in here I would be able to do uh Let's do here if let sum and we want address, right? Um, and then if there is one of those, we would be able to print We would want to like include the you ordered for delivery, which this is this is messy. We would we would fix this because it's not great right now, but it should get us where we want to go. Um, which we don't even need to. We know if we're in here. I think that's not going to be happy with you. Oh, this, yeah, this should fine. this should work, I think. Yeah. Um, so we ordered for delivery, and then the delivery address is going to be whatever gets entered here. So then I can, if we are delivery, instead of this, I should be able to do get address and pass in matches. And I think it just works. So let's let's try it. Nice. Sweet. That's dope. Okay, and then if I change this out and we say pick up. That's cool. That is very cool. I uh I dig this. This is like this is super fun. I I really, really like the feel of working with Rust. Like it it's a it's very clearly um well considered. Like the the language design is is good, um, God, man, I like this a lot. Okay, so we have we are like maybe five minutes left. So if that's not enough time, we can also just like kick to some uh, to some further resources and and call this one a success. But is there anything else you want to show before we wrap? Um, not really. I mean, this has been yeah, it's been great. I think you know a good case for. You know, if you want to learn how to use Rust or you want an excuse to use it more and you don't want to go the traditional kind of, you know, like clone some other data from from an API and build up a, a service, like a command line app is a great way to do it. You know, find yourself doing something often if you're writing a bash script for it or you normally like write a Python script and you want to play with Rust, it's, it's really fast. And like we've seen here, it, it gives you a lot of... Uh, you know, type guarantees. It gives you a lot of of help as you go along. It's and someone mentioned it earlier in the chat. It's uh, what were they saying? It was uh, you know the compiler really. It it's almost like not to use the same term, but a copilot. Like it's there with you. And if you do something mm. you're not supposed to, like things like you know I need a string and not a string pointer. Yeah, it'll um, it'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> It's you know my favorite way of learning something new is is building something, doing it wrong, and having something you know tell me that I'm doing it wrong and maybe help me with how to fix it. Nice. Um, yeah, and so we we built this thing on. Uh, let's see here. We so we built it on like 0.1.0 of the Rust CLI. We're using Cargo. Uh, let me just check the Cargo version. We're using Cargo version 1.53.0. I'm not sure if that's the latest or not. Um, and I think like we're using Rust C 1.53.0. So I think, I don't know if these are like in lockstep or not, but, um, this is, I mean, this is really, 
this is powerful stuff. It, it doesn't feel like too much. It feels like something that I can do. The, the docs are amazing. Um, so, all right. So for somebody who wants to learn more, what would you recommend they go and, and look at, um, bearing in mind, we've, we've looked at like wrestlings and now we know that docs.rs is, is a thing where we can go look up our, our different pack, our different crates. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's really, um, yeah, we mentioned uh, wrestlings, we mentioned documentation, you know, we mentioned kind of, uh, there's, a I don't have the link for it offhand, but there's a rust, um, discord server, uh, and, you know, if you're into open source, there's tools like I mentioned Starship. It's a very, you know, kind of the hotness of uh, command line prompts. Uh, and it's, uh, oh, that doesn't you know, the right. community there is a little smaller, but it's, you know, if you want to get in and build a, a, an application and, and learn it, that's kind of, for me, the, the best way to go from, you know, an initial tutorial to, and yeah, exactly. The Rust Lang site is, um, it's got all sorts of documentation tools, tutorials, and they have all sorts of different ways to learn about them. Um, the Rust, you know, Discord server has a lot of, a lot of folks learning and, and sharing a lot of different things. And also I, I think, you know, you'll probably see a lot on Twitter about Rust. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I've noticed a lot of, uh, you know, the, the full stack, like, JavaScript devs or, or people like that that are poking around with Rust and learning more and, and starting to share. It's it's kind of an exciting time where Rust has been around for for several years now, but it's it people are are starting to pick it up more more actively and really start to use it and build really cool stuff with it. So I think mm -hmm. it's a really great time for the community if you're you know interested in in building things and really learning out in public. Like it's a really yeah. fun language and it's. Uh, the community is fantastic. Yeah, I'll do a, a quick shout out to uh, to Chris Biscardi, who's been in the chat with us today. He that's not this is not the website. What am I doing? Jeez. Uh, Chris has a whole bunch of Rust material, and it's all very good. And uh, you should you should go and check it out. So um, make sure you go look at that. I know he's been building some games. He's been he's been working on uh, foundational stuff does a lot of kind of learning in public and, and and sharing of that as well. So make sure you go check out Chris's stuff. Chris also let me know that when I said that I was building on Rust CLI version 0.1.0, I wasn't. It's my my app is called Rust CLI and its version is 0.1.0. I'm a doofus. <laughs> Sorry. So um, with that being said, uh, John, thank you so much for hanging out. Everybody make sure you go and, and give John a follow on Twitter. Um, it's a lot of a lot of fun information um and uh yeah so we can also you can get live captioning of this show and every show on the homepage of learnwithjason.dev it is done by rachel from white coat captioning uh she's with us today writing down all the silly things i say and that is made possible by netlify fauna auth zero and hasura who all sponsor the show and make it a little more accessible which i deeply appreciate Make sure while you're checking out the site, you go and check out the schedule because we've got so many amazing things coming up. We have, uh, let's see, what else is, what's what's happening? So next week I'm out. Next week I'm going to a cabin in the woods and I'm going to have no internet and it's going to be amazing. Uh, but the week after that, we're going to have, uh, Daniel Peary is going to be on the show. We're going to have Tamaj Lakami teaching us about serverless functions and TypeScript. Uh, we've got Shushtika coming to teach us about real-time Jamstack apps. I'm really, like, really excited about that one. It's going to be so fun to learn. Um, and then Moriel is going to come teach us about right to left support for websites, which if you've never seen right to left support, please come and check this one out because it sounds like it's simple and it's really not. So uh, come and learn about all the things that can make the world hard for the billion plus people who use right to left for their, their writing language. Um, with that, I think we've got ourselves a successful episode. John, thank you again for hanging out. Any, any parting words for us? No, oh, thanks. This has been great. All right. Well, thank you, chat. Y'all come, uh, y'all come back now. But uh, for now, let's go find somebody to raid, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>